Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's webinar for parents, for specifically for ECD parents. I'm Johan van Lul, and I'm the coordinator of the Kiro Learner Support Unit. Tonight, we're going to talk about discipline and routine in early childhood development. But before delving into the significance of discipline and routine in early childhood development, it's essential to first explore the various parenting styles as these fundamentally influence how such concepts are implemented and perceived by young learners. Now, we need to look at this image because this is quite an important image when it comes to parenting styles. It's a visual representation of the four primary parenting styles as conceptualized in, in, in the developmental, in developmental psychology. Now, these styles are mapped on a grid that has two axes, if you look there. Um, the one is all about responsiveness, and the other one is all about demandingness. And so let me break down each quadrant for you. So let's start off with authoritative parenting, uh, positioned high on both responsiveness and demandingness. And this style is marked by a balance of clear high expectations with warmth and responsiveness. And parents who adopt this style engage in, democratic, in a democratic approach are assertive but not intrusive or restrictive. And they set clear standards and are flexible and often using reasoning and discussion um, to guide their children. On the, underneath there, we've got the authoritarian parenting style where it's very high on the demands from you as a parent, but low on the responsiveness to the emotional needs of your child. And this style is characterized by strict rules and expectations, and there's lit little open dialogue between the parent and the child. Authoritarian parents expect the, their orders to be obeyed without explanation, leading to a structured environment, and they often employ punishment to enforce rules, leading to a more emotionally distant relationship with their children. And then we've got the permissive parenting style, which is high on responsiveness, so, uh, but low on demandingness. And permissive parents are indulgent, avoid confrontation, and allow their children considerable freedom with few rules or expectations. And they are non-directive, very lenient, and typically do not require mature behavior, leading to a situation where the child often ends up having a lot of control in that family. And then you get the uninvolved parenting style, which are low on both axes. Uninvolved parents are often seen as neglectful or absent, and they do not set firm boundaries or high standards, are indifferent to their children's needs and are not responsive. And they offer little in the way of support or nurturing and may be uninterested or unaware of their children's needs and achievements. So understanding these styles is crucial for parents as they reflect on their approach to parenting. And each style has a different impact on child development, with authoritative parenting generally being associated with the most positive outcome in terms of child behavior and emotional development. So this model can guide parents in becoming more reflective and intentional in their interaction with their children, aiming for a balanced approach that fosters independence while still providing guiding and support. What is important is that you can have various permissive, uh, various parenting styles in various situations. It depends. Sometimes you are an authoritative parent, sometimes you are a more permissive parent, and sometimes you are more authoritarian when you need to make uh, quick decisions, and then you will use language like I said so. Um, it depends on the situation, but we vary these things, and it, these have a very um, a big impact on your approach to discipline. I would like us to go a little bit more into the different styles, just for you to understand it more in terms of ECD and also uh, in terms of how this is applicable to discipline. So if we look at the authoritarian parent, usually this parent is very, um, is a disciplinarian, 
Um, we also kind of call them tongue in the cheek, the dictator, the controller. Uh, parents who employ uh, um, authoritarian styles tend to have very strict rules in the family. They focus on discipline and often limit open dialogue with their children. They use words like I said so uh, because this is in my house, this is how it works, that kind of thing. So they have very high demands and expectations of their children, but they have a low responsiveness to their child's emotional needs and desires because they have such high demands. Um, so strict rules, limited emotional warmth and high expectations. So if you answer yes to all these, um, you might sometimes go often into this parenting style. Does not mean all the time, but you might often use this. So, and if you say yes to any of these questions, a lot of them, then this will help you to determine. So do I enforce strict rules and expect complete compliance from my child at all times? Um, do I show little or no room for negotiation or compromise when my child requests it? Uh, do I consistently prioritize discipline over my child's individuality, suppressing their personal expression and choices? Um, is my primary focus on ensuring my child's obedience to authority without any questions? Uh, do I seldom provide positive feedback, focusing instead of what my child does incorrectly? If you have a lot of yeses to these questions, then you go often into this authoritarian parenting style. And the last one is I'm inclined to use punitive measures as a first response to my child's undesirable behavior. So if you answer yes, then you know you are going into this parenting style quite often. Um, just to give it a bit more context, um, we call these, this parenting style also the lions and because they are very protective uh, of their families. So if a child um, experience failure, they will say things like, I expect better from you, you've studied more, um, and they will kind of go into a punitive thing like not going out this weekend. If the child is doing well, that's what I expect from you at all time, continue to perform like this. So they are very demanding uh, on that. So it has an impact on, on children. Um, it often results in obedient and, and proficient uh, children who may lack self-esteem, creativity and decision-making skills. And as adults, they may have difficulty with problem solving, suffer from anxiety and may be prone to depression. So you can think also back to the parenting style that you were um, exposed to most in the family when you grew up. And then we get the other one which is the one we, we try to strive to, which is the authoritative parenting style. This is a very balanced parent, that it's a negotiator parent, a very democratic parent. And if we have time and most of the time, this is the one we all try to be. So these parents strike a balance between demand and responsiveness, and they are involved in their child's education, but also they are open to dialogue and feedback. So the characteristic are they've got high demands, but they're also highly responsive to their child's emotional needs and desires. These parents will always say, I want what is best for my child, um, but my child's happiness is also important to me. So um, their behavior traits, they have balanced rules and discipline. They've got open dialogue about the rules and discipline but they also focus a lot on having a nurturing environment where children feel safe and, and the space is open to them. So to check if you've got this style and you often uh, use this style, if you answer yes to these questions, then you know you often using this parenting style. Something like, do I set clear expectations and rules while also explaining the reasons behind them to my child? Um, do I engage in open and supportive dialogue, encouraging my child to express their thoughts and feelings on whatever is happening? And do I value both my child's ability to follow rules and their independence, promoting self-discipline and autonomy? Um, and do I take an active interest in my child's school activities and overall well-being, showing support for their efforts 
and their challenges. And then do I adapt my parenting strategies as my child grows and changes? So do I have a different style now and differently handling them when they were like two years old and between two and five years old, understanding that different stages require different approaches. We call these um, parents the, the oak trees because they are sturdy and strong, yet providing shade and protection. And the oak tree symbolizes a balanced combination of rules and warmth, similar to the authoritative parenting style. So these parents will usually react to failure. I notice you struggled with this. Let's discuss what went wrong. How can we work together on this to improve? And when there's good news, I'm really proud of your hard work. You can be proud of your hard work. Keep it up um, because they focus on the effort and that the learning through the process that is, that's important to them. Generally, well-adjusted, happy and successful in academics and extracurricular activities, these children um, and the long-term impact, they grow into competent adults, skilled at balancing personal and professional life, often with a strong sense of self-worth. And as I said, that in your day, you might, ex you might apply different parenting styles, but this is the one that we strive to that is best for your children in the long run. If we look at the permissive parenting, um, that's the parent who tries to be their child's friend. They are a bit of a pushover. Sometimes we are, and sometimes the situation is so. If we may be on holiday, um, then yes, we try to be the friend. We are going with the flow. Um, we don't have to, to control everything. Um, so sometimes we use this, this style, but if you use it too often, and if, it's, it's, if this is your dominating style, then it can really um, create problems with boundaries. Um, and the, the, that your, your child's activities are not uh, are then overwhelmed, overwhelming them and you. So there are low demands from your side, but you respond to every emotional need and desire of your child. So for, for this parent, having happy children and that they their children are kind of in control is more than their own expectations of, of their parents. Of the, of, the, of the parents from their side. So the, usually there are very few rules, um, there are few guidelines of uh, in the family. Uh, they don't really like a routine, but they're very nurturing and loving, and they really do not like confrontation. So they will do everything to keep this child happy. You often see this when the, they give them, they shower them with too many gifts, um, that kind of thing where where they really, if the child is not feeling, if the child is difficult, then they will say, what, what can I give you, uh, take this. So yeah, that's with, with, which is usually a problem. So to check if you are going to this style often, if you say yes to many of these, then you are often in this permissive parenting style. Do I set few or no rules and boundaries for my child? Do I give in easily to my child's request or demands? It's like when you say you need to stop doing this, we want to, we all need to come and eat, and then the child says, no, I want to eat here. Yeah. So then do you give in? Um, if you're in the shop and you told the child, we're not going to buy this today, and they keep on demanding at the end because they're throwing a tantrum in the shop, you just put it in the basket and you buy it. So do you often easily give in to their requests and demands? Do I avoid conflict and confrontation with my child? Do you use different ways or do you just ignore when they do things so that you that you do not have to confront them with things? And do I often act more like a friend than a parent to my child? And do I struggle to enforce consequences consistently when my child behaves inappropriate? For instance, if you if you bring in some form of um, to help them to understand whatever went wrong, um, like time out. But when you uh, say, I'm going to give you time out, this is going to happen, but you do not enforce it. You do not keep um, the consequences of what they've done. Uh, or you are inconsistent with that. The one day it's time out, but the next day for the same thing, they don't get it. So the child doesn't feel really safe. We call these parents the willow trees 
They're very flexible and bending like the willow tree. Um, external forces, instead of resisting or providing structure, much like permissive parents, yield their children's desires. Um, so if this child experiences failure, you tell them, if this is your parenting style, most often you tell them, oh, it's okay, everyone has off days. Do you want to get some ice cream? So you want them to feel better. Um, if they win, you say, that's amazing. I'm so proud of you. Let's celebrate however you'd like. So if the child is in control in the style. So in the short term, the children may struggle with self-regulation because um, there are no boundaries and they also might uh, experience lack of responsibility. And they may also face challenges in academic settings. And in the long term, um, they might be coming entitled adults who struggle with relationships and professional settings. They very it's very difficult for them to work for somebody uh, with authority over them. They often challenge authority um, because they're not used to boundaries and and they start challenging the boundaries also at work. And then you get the helicopter parents, um, and there's a bit of a tongue in the cheek. A name, um, but it's important for us to talk about this. So this parent constantly monitor the child's activities, their academic life, what's happening at school, uh, questioning techniques and methods and showing a desire to be overly involved with every aspect of their child's life. So they're over involved, they control everything. Usually these parents don't allow their children to make any decisions. They make the decisions for them. Uh, they don't allow their children to make choices um, and they get anxious when children are making choices. So they constantly monitor their child's activities. They are overprotective um, and they, the frequency of emails and phone calls and unscheduled visits wherever the children are. Um, they constantly email the school, constantly call the teacher. Um, all those things, they are just constantly like little helicopters over their child and they go whoop, 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 just to know everything about their child. Usually they're the ones at the children's party who will always be with the children. They won't let them go um, because they just want to protect them. So their over monitoring can lead to really lots of stress, uh, especially sometimes for teachers as well as other learners and parents. Um, and that's quite important for us to talk about that. So uh, to determine are you if you're answering yes to a lot of these questions, then you really need to think about if you are not a helicopter parent. Do I constantly check in on my child's activities and progress? Um, do I try to be involved in every decision making process related to my child? Do I often intervene in conflicts or challenges facing my child? Um, am I highly concerned with my child's performance and outcomes? So this kind of parent will be the one who will go to coach or who will go to teacher and tell them this is what's going to happen how you they will never they will never empower their children to do these things they will do it on behalf of their children um, and then they will also say could my involvement be considered overbearing or sometimes even intrusive although we call them uh, helicopter parents we also sometimes call them like the hovering hawks always on the lookout, watching clothing from above and ready to swoop down at the first sign of trouble, much like the ever watchful helicopter parent. So for them, typical reactions would be if there's failure, I'll speak to your teacher about this, not you, but I'll speak. Maybe you need some extra tutoring. I'll set it up for you. So you do everything for your child. Um, winning, great job. I knew the strategy that I found for you would work. So when they win, you take the credit for it. I'll make sure we keep on top of everything else too. So you keep, you are in control of everything. So the short term impact is that children may show anxiety and struggle with decision making and problem solving. And in the long term, there can be a risk of lots of psychological issues, which is so ironic because a helicopter parent just wants what is best for the child. And they really try their best 
for their children, but the, and they don't often realize that the psychological issues that they are causing their children in the long term is really harmful. So it's quite ironic. Um, and that's why it's very important to know if you are a helicopter parent to do something about this. And if you realize that you are a helicopter parent, you, there is help. So go to a therapist. Um, educational therapists are great with this because they know children um, that can help you, um, but you can also go to any other kind of therapist um, to, to help you with this because um, in the long run, this is not good for your child. I know you have your best interest at heart of the child, but this is not because it will cause a lot of anxiety, can lead to depression, and also it may struggle with independence as adults, and they struggle then to have a proper, uh, independent, good, healthy relationships when they go into relationships as adults. So these are all the different kinds of parenting styles, and to be aware of these parenting styles, there are many more, I just highlighted a few of them, um, but it's important because this has a very big impact when you approach routine and when you approach discipline. Because if you are a permissive parent, your, your disciplinary style is going to be very, very permissive. And if you are a helicopter parent, that will be the routine will be very, very strict and you will then uh, determine the routine yourself. So um, the child will have kind of no input in it. So it's important to understand the various parenting styles before we start talking about discipline. So let's understand discipline. Discipline means in essence to follow. Um, it's to learn. That's all the words that, that are associated with discipline. So um, as a parent, it's crucial to understand that, especially in early childhood, that discipline is not about punishment or about strict rules. It's about following. It's about setting an example. It's about guiding. It's about understanding behavior um, and to encourage acceptable behavior. Remember, behavior is not the bad thing. Behavior is a form of communication. So discipline should allow a child to communicate with you through their behavior because it's just so much easier for them to communicate with you in that way. So it's about teaching self-control, it's about responsibility, and it's also about res respect in a nurturing way. And discipline in these early years set then the foundation for your child's future behavior. Um, it's not just about correcting misbehavior, it's about showing them the difference between what is right and what is wrong in a safe and supportive environment. Children must make mistakes to learn. If, they do, if they're not allowed to make mistakes, if they don't allow to experience failure, how are they going to learn? So for a helicopter parent, for instance, or for a very authoritarian parent, it's very difficult to accept that their children are human beings who can make mistakes. Um, and it's important for them to make those mistakes, to take responsibility, to fail in responsibility, because when they're adults, they need to learn that as young children, because if they make mistakes as adults, it might have very, very um, big consequences for, for them. So remember, you are your child's first teacher. The way you model behavior and set boundaries play a critical role in their understanding of discipline. Discipline is not a one-way thing. It, discipline should be understood by the parent, the teacher, and the child. The child should also know that what that what what does it mean, um, and that it and it. And for many children, they think about discipline as I'm going to get punished. So they need to understand that discipline is being an uh, uh, is developing into a mature adult um, who, who really has respect and responsibility in all the things I've already said. And then let's talk a bit about self-regulation. So one of the most important skills your child can learn 
is self-regulation. So this means managing your emotions, controlling your impulses. So if you see something which you like, it's not yours, you need to control your impulses um, and also how to adapt to new situations. So effective discipline helps your child develop these crucial skills. So in many situations, discipline, it doesn't mean to say no, it means to say, I can see you want that, but it's not yours. You can either ask for it, but if they take it and to say, no, it doesn't belong to you, the, it, it does not teach them anything. If you say, I could see you take it, but let's think about it. Is it yours or not? So if you really want it, then you could have asked. So that's when you go into that authoritative parenting style to explain, to talk about it, to think together, and to solve the problem together. Consistent discipline strategies help form positive behavior patterns. Um, and remember, that's how the brain learns. The brain learns from patterns. Um, and this then leads to fewer behavior issues and enhances social interactions. And when your child knows what is expected and feels secure in those expectations, they are more likely to exhibit positive behavior. Remember, success uh, creates more success. It's a positive spiral. Um, and we really would like to tell children what we want them to do, rather to tell them to stop doing something. So, um, and that is better. And remember, uh, and, and just if you're aware, I haven't used the word punishment at all in any of these, because punishment is not really, for me, part of discipline. Discipline also plays a vital role in emotional development. It teaches children how to handle frustration, how, about how to deal with anger, disappointment in a healthy manner. manner. Learning these skills early help them to navigate more complex emotions as they grow. And then the benefits of effective discipline extend far into the future. Children who have been disciplined appropriately tend to have better social skills, perform better academically and have a more positive approach to learning and social uh, interaction. And they're also so much more comfortable and healthy in any relationship. And that's what we want them to be one day, to be comfortable in a loving relationship with their partner, with their children and everyone around them. There are quite a lot of misconceptions about discipline. And one of them I already addressed, but I want to stress this a lot. Discipline equals punishment is a, uh, is a big misconception. It's a common misunderstanding that discipline means punishing your child for wrongdoings. Often you would hear people say, but you need to discipline your child. And then you think that it equals punishment. No, it's not what it means. It means that you need to teach your child how to act in different situations. Um, so it's about giving them guidance. It's about teaching a child how to behave appropriately, um, not just penalizing them when they don't. So um, that's a, a big misconception. And then also another misconception is that strict rules are the basis of good discipline. While boundaries are essential, um, being overly strict can be really counterproductive. Effective discipline involves clear, consistent guidelines um, delivered with understanding and empathy. And it's not about setting rigid rules, uh, but about helping your child learn self-control and responsibility in a safe and supportive environment. And then also there's another misconception that discipline stifles a child's personality. Some parents worry that enforcing discipline might suppress their child's personality or creativity. You often get this in permissive parents, uh, in uninvolved parents. Um, so on the contrary, good discipline provides a structure that helps children feel secure, allowing their personalities to flourish within safe boundaries. And then there's also a misconception that young children don't understand discipline. Even very young children can grasp the basics of discipline. It's all about age-appropriate expectations, um, understanding your own parenting style, and then teaching them in ways they understand. 
simple, consistent rules and routines really help children learn what is expected from them. And if they're used to these routines and if they're used to these rules, they know what to do and then they feel safe and they will, their behavior will then also um, comply with that. And then the last one that you know, there are many misconceptions, I only chose five, immediate compliance is a good sign of discipline. So it's that thing where uh, if you walk past the classroom and the children are so quiet, you think, oh, that's a good teacher. If you if the children are sitting quiet and they're compliant, then that, if that's, a, that's a total miss, myth. Expecting instant obedience every time you set a rule is really unrealistic. Um, children are learning and testing boundaries as part of their development. They should test their boundaries and it's the way that you're going to deal with it that's going to um, set them up for life. So effective discipline is about guiding them towards the right behavior over time and not demanding immediate perfection. So your authoritarian parents, the lions, they usually kind of expect immediate perfection. but it's the journey, um, the growth mindset that I often refer to in these webinars from Carol Dweck, it's where she says that if you fail or you're not there, then you're just not there yet. So immediate perfection is not, it's more about the process and how we deal with the process to get to, to good behavior. So the role of routine in child development we, um, you will often hear from your teachers say you need to have a good routine. Um, you hear it in hospital when your little one is born. The first thing the nurses will tell you, just get your child into routine. Um, I love this picture because it, it's done with the child. And that was the child's routine, like wake up, get dressed. And this was designed for their own morning routine. Um, and that's so that you can be uh, ready early. And when it comes to routine in child development, children should be part of this process. They should be part of any, every aspect of it. They also should help design these routines so that they can take ownership of it and they are, so that it, it must not a top down approach routine is not the ideal because they really need to help um, figure this out themselves. So to get ready to school, there's a routine and they should be part of this. Um, so what is what are the benefits of establishing routine? Um, it gives a consistent structure for your child's day. Um, your, your early childhood um, facilitator or teacher will, will pick it up very easily if your child is in a routine. The structure is incredibly reassuring for them. They feel safe. Knowing what comes next in the day really gives them a sense of security and stability, which is especially comforting for young children. Uh, routines play a key role in your child's emotional health, and when they know what to expect each day, they really feel more in control and less anxious. And this predictability um, and this predictable environment helps them remain calm and emotionally balanced, and it's a foundation that, that's crucial for healthy emotional development. And it, it's a structured, a structured day aids also uh, in improving focus, establishing good habits, and enhancing your child's ability to follow directions. Uh, such, as, uh, such an environment supports cognitive development and makes learning more effective and enjoyable for them when they go to school. So there are key elements of an effective routine. Um, playtime, including playtime in your child's routine is essential. Play isn't just for fun, it's a vital a part of learning and development. So allowing your child to explore, imagine and understand the world in a unique way should be part of the routine and different kinds of play. From structured play to free play, um, family play, playing with each other. There are just many and you need to make that part of your thing. Also structured learning activities should be part of their daily routine. So choose age appropriate games and activities like reading and problem solving games, uh, interactive tasks that stimulate their minds and foster curiosity. Ask your teacher 
all keto teachers in ECD are so well trained, so that they will really um, give you wonderful ideas of things that you can do with your child at home that's fun and that's integrated and that will also uh, benefit them a lot. Regular meal times are also important too. They help regulate your child's metabolism, provide valuable opportunities for social interaction and learning. Um, and it's essential life skills like table manners, but also it, when your child is at that age to make them part of the food preparation, um, it's quality time with them. Um, even if it's the most simplest task that they do, get them involved. Um, and don't forget to include nap times and rest periods. Remember, a lot of brain development happens while you are sleeping. People always think that children should be awake to develop. Sleeping is a big part of child development. So adequate rest is as crucial as active learning and play. It really supports physical growth. It aids in memory consolidation um, and it helps with brain wiring and brain development and ensures that your child has the energy they need for the next day to learn and explore. I think we underestimate the value of good sleep for our children and we really need to look at if our children are really experiencing good sleep. Some practical tips for implementing discipline in routine. Um, so let's start with effective discipline. Um, establish consistent daily routines are part of discipline uh, because that really helps children to understand what is expected from them. So if they know what is expected from them, then it's much easier to have an effective discipline at home. The consistency really provides a sense of security and predictability. Keep your rules simple, clear, understandable, um, appropriate for your child's age, and explain these rules in language that your child can understand, explain the consequences of the rules, and most important, if they are old enough, Get them involved by setting them these rules so that they can also take ownership of these rules. And where safe and appropriate, allow children to experience the natural consequences of the actions, um, teaching them cause and effect. I think we are not teaching cause and effect to our children because we are just too, we are just too good parents. We we keep them from making mistakes. Um, we want them to be perfect. So they need to, where are they going to learn cause and effect? And use positive reinforcement to encourage good behavior, praise, thumbs up, sticker, any of those positive coding elements that will really reinforce good behavior. So we would rather um, give them positive rewards for good behavior, uh, then punish them for negative behavior because we want to focus on the positive, what they are doing right. And we need to recognize that rather than, than um, to focus on the negative. Remember, when you are a very busy parent for children, any form of attention is, is attention if it's positive or negative. Um, so if you only respond to them when they're doing something wrong, then they figure out, oh, that's the best way to get attention from my dad. At least he looks up from his phone or his laptop. So then they will start doing all these negative things because they want the attention. So the best way usually is to ignore the negative um, uh, the negative action and rather when they do something positive to give them then all the warmth and the and the attention that they are they are really craving so that's important that they must know positive behavior gets a lot of attention negative behavior i withdraw from you and then also we all know the concept of time out I like time in where the child sits with the parent and talks about their feelings and behavior, fostering emotional understanding and self-regulation. And then also redirect negative behavior by offering alternative activities or changing the environment. Um, and it's especially effective for toddlers. Um, and then children learn by imitation. So model the behavior you expect to see. 
Um, if you're going to throw a tantrum in the shop when they throw a tantrum, look, that's kind of counterproductive. So if you demonstrate patience, respect and empathy, um, they're going to pick up on that. And then the best one for me as a parent was to choose your battles. Focus on the most important rules and be willing to let some of the less significant issues slide away occasionally. And then cool down periods is something that children should learn. They should know that they need them sometimes because everyone gets angry. So to teach your child to take a break, maybe a century break, uh, to cool down when emotions run high and also deep breathing um, as is also very good to, to get calm. Uh, mindfulness, all those things really help children to, to self-regulate. Um, maintain firm boundaries, but deliver discipline with warmth and love. Your tone and approach should communicate care, not anger or frustration. So either golden rule is when they go louder, you go softer. When they go harder, you go softer. Uh, when they go wilder, you go calmer. So that's kind of um, how you usually manage these uh, situations. It's important to um, instead of just stating the consequences, explain the reason behind them, because this helps children understand the impact of their actions. This might happen only a little bit later when everybody is calm, but it's important for them to understand the impact of their actions. And then listen to your child's perspective and show empathy. Understanding their feelings and needs can often reduce the frequency of misbehavior. If you go to the shop, and every time it's a problem, start listening. Why? Start thinking, why is it always? Is it, are they tired? Don't they want to go? Is it overwhelming? Um, so to think about why there is misbehavior and also to, 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 to think about the patterns. And then teach them problem solving skills um, so, so that they can and, and, and help them to identify the problem and also to come up with possible solutions if it happens frequently and at the same time. And then studies have shown that physical discipline can really be harmful, um, ineffective. Um, there are so many other methods that you can use. Um, it is against the law in South Africa. Um, so this is a very controversial issue. Physical discipline, um, uh, there is a thing that they always say violence, uh, violence create violence. Um, so if you, um, this is just something that you should abstain from. Um, and then use privileged removal as consequences for older children, but ensure that the pr privilege is related to the misbehavior. This is quite important. Don't make promises that you can't keep. Many times you will tell children if they're older that um, I'm going to take away your phone for a month, but you need the phone to communicate with your child. So that is not an appropriate uh, consequence. So find other consequences that are short term, long term, um, make lists of things that you can take away, um, but do not take away things that are essential because that will just undermine your discipline and your authority. And then I can't stress this enough. Use visual aids like charts and pictures for younger children to remind them of rules and routines. Put them in the shower, what they need to do, the sequence. Put it up um, making breakfast. Put these visuals everywhere because children just follow visuals so much easier um, than if you're only telling uh, them what to do. And then about the daily routines. Uh, consider the unique needs, the temperament, the energy levels of your child, as well as the overall family schedule to create a routine that works for everyone. Identify and prioritize essential activities such as mealtime, school uh, or learning periods, playtime and bedtime. Um, always remember to bring in breaks for the children. You should schedule that as part of the routine. It should be very um, open and children should know it should be structured um, and then they know exactly they can also be part to choose what they want to do in the different breaks. Um, make sure your child understands the daily routine. Use the visual schedules and charts for younger children to provide them with clear reminders. 
involve your child in the creation of these routines to give them a sense of ownership and control, which can lead to better cooperation. And then a lot of these daily routines you can cover with family meetings. I'm a big fan of family meetings, so regularly the family meetings will uh, will be to discuss the routine, any necessary adjustments, and ensuring everyone everyone's needs are considered, give them the opportunity to talk about their needs and how they want to change things, and then you can all discuss if it's feasible or not. Keep wake up and bedtimes consistent, even on, on weekends if you can, because it really helps to regulate your child's body clock. And encourage, encourage habits like laying out clothes or packing school bags the night before to streamline mornings. We all know how chaotic, how chaotic mornings can be in households. Use timers and alarms to help manage transitions. You get wonderful apps that you can use, apps that are linked with your child's phone. If your child have a phone at that age, um, it, there are many little things that you can do. And also be realistic. Set realistic time frames for each part of the routine. Um, allow some buffer time for the unexpected thing. Um, educate them on flexibility. The teacher tell that sometimes the routine can change, such as, as on special occasions or when someone is sick and that that is OK. Um, and as children grow and family circumstances change, review these things and adjust the routines accordingly. And then very important, especially when you use visual things, give them stars and stickers when they follow these routines. Um, recognize when they are doing things right. That is the important thing. That is how you 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 develop discipline in children and ensure there's unstructured time within the day for children to choose their activities um, because that will foster independence and creativity. And then also um, handle resistance. You see calm when resistance occurs, handle it calmly and consistently to reinforce the importance of routine. And that's all I want to do tonight with you guys. Um, it's time now for some questions. If you have any questions, I've just lost my, um, I just need to get back to the, there you go. I've lost it now for a moment. I'm so sorry for that one. I pressed the wrong button. So if you have any questions, you are more than welcome to post it in the Q&A section now. Uh, I will try and answer them uh, to the best of my ability. So I'm going to give you a bit of time uh, to write these questions if you have any. If you don't have any questions, you are more than welcome to log off at this point. And I really appreciate it that you joined us tonight. Remember, we have another one next week's Wednesday, next week Wednesday at the same time. Um, and we will carry on with these uh, webinars. You can also, if you joined us late, you can um, you can also watch these uh, webinars online. Um, if you would like the the PowerPoint deck, you can request it from your school. I will make sure your school will have it tomorrow morning so that they can send it to you. So you can just contact your your um, preschool and the the head there will already have it tomorrow morning. So if you have any questions, you're welcome to put them in uh, the Q&A section. So far, we don't have any. So I think all the information was clear. You're more than welcome to contact me directly if you have any questions. My email address is Johan V without any uh, stop. It's Johan V. J O H A N V at kiro.co.za. So you're more than welcome. If you ask your uh, school, if you want to make contact with me, if you need any assistance, they can just contact me at the Kiro Learner Support Unit, or you can send me an email at johanv at kiro.co.za. Here's one question. What is the best way to handle a really bad tantrum? Nicole, the best way to handle it, and I'm just going to publish this one, the best way to handle it is to prevent it, we always say. So if you if if there is a tantrum, um, if, you, if you are in a space where you can leave it, you withdraw attention from a, from a tantrum, you don't give more attention because the more attention you give, uh, um, the more the negative 
um, the negative attention will just grow. So the best way is to withdraw any attention, to not give some more, because the more attention you give, the worse it will get. The best way to handle it is to prevent it, um, is to think about why did it happen? Is it because there was an information overload? Was it caused by too much sensory information? Because children often have tantrums if they experience an information or a, a sensory overload. So because of sound, because of uh, many different um, things. So it's, 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 it's really the best way is to think about the sensory load of your child. Um, that will help you to prevent it. It's also when they are overly tired, um, all those kind of things. So yes, the best way, Nicole, to, uh, to, to handle a tantrum is to prevent it. Um, once you're in it, you just have to ride it out. So you need to, you need to wait, remove any attention, and then at some point, what some people also do is then um, they kind of um, repeat what they do, but that we have different uh, results with. Here's another question. Uh, what to do when your child sulk for too long, even when you explain why you don't approve of certain things? Um, the best way is then also to remove attention uh, because the sulking is just to get more negative attention. Think about how much attention you give your child um, and then you can distract them. So by giving some uh, positive things to do, um, to describe the, to them what is the behavior. So if they're sulking because they have to come and eat, you tell them not to stop sulking. You tell them, join us at the table. So you tell them the, the behavior that you would like them to display. So um, that is the golden rule, um, not telling them to stop sulking. So that's not going to work. Um, and you create an environment where they can join you where there's positive energy and where they will experience positive things. So do not go and cuddle and say, oh, stop, stop all those things. That's just uh, prolonging the sulking. And there's another question. How often do you, uh, how do you deal with sudden changes in aggression? Again, it's the same as tantrum. We need to think about why. Um, aggression is usually go with anxiety. So what is causing the anxiety? Remember, um, anxiety is um, you have different responses to anxiety. You can have a flight response where you remove yourself, but you can also have a fight response to anxiety. So if there is a, a change uh, in the, the aggression, then you need to know your child is experiencing anxiety. Think about what is causing the anxiety and remove that trigger rather than dealing with the aggression. So um, the regression is also to then give them some breathing exercises helps a lot. Um, so if they are aggressive, teach them how to breathe. I will also like the one where I say make the ice man and make the jelly man, make the ice man, make the jelly man. So it's those kind of things will help them. Uh, breathing is a very good exercise. So remember behind the aggression, there's always anxiety and you would really like to uh, like to do that. Um, there's also this email. You can use that one. That's also my private email. I just want to publish all the questions. Um, but you can also um, you can also email me at Kiro, which is Johan V at Kiro.co.za. Okay. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us. I have a wonderful evening. Uh, get cracking on those routines and I hope you have a different understanding of discipline after this uh, parent webinar. And I'm looking forward to see you guys again next week, the same time uh, at seven o'clock. Thank you so much. Have a lovely evening. And from me, Johan van Lille, goodbye until next time.